So um, all my presentations are online. If you go to my website, just go to bushfarms.com and go to beekeeping and go down the left hand side till you see presentations. If you go to that page, it's got all my PowerPoints there if you want to look at any of them, including this one. Um, everything that's in my books out there is on my website. So um, you can read them for free. Also, I have quite a few Queen Marie books that I have published if you want to buy them on paper, but you can also read most of those for free on my website as well. Uh, if you go down, go to beekeeping, go down the left hand side to classic beekeeping books and go there, you'll find uh, Jace, both the Jay Smith's Queen Marie books and uh, the Miller Method and the Alley Method and a whole bunch of uh, Hopkins Method, a whole bunch of uh, Queen Marie books. Um, for those of you who really want an ebook, you can read all this online for free, but if you really want an ebook, um, you can go to my website, go to beekeeping, and click on books up in the upper left hand corner. It'll take you to the page with all the books that I publish, and most of those are available as an ebook. You can buy them on the page. I don't do the ebooks. My books I mostly sell on Amazon, but I don't do the ebooks on Amazon because I sell books, they get 20%. I sell an ebook. They don't even have to ship a book, and they want forty percent. I, I don't understand that. So, so I don't. I don't sell them through Amazon. You can buy them straight from me, and it won't have any DRM on it or anything like that. It won't be protected. You can just go read it, um, and, and I get a hundred percent of it instead of instead of uh, sixty percent of it. Um, I, every year, I have a bee camp at my house. Um, I didn't want to uh, leave people out because I couldn't afford it, so I actually have the week before bee camp is, is work week, and if you come to work week, you can earn a week at camp and come to camp for free. Um, but basically, I call this my Tom Sawyer bee camp. I want you to come to my house and pay me and do all my work for me. <laughs> <coughs> that's, that's the plan. Um, I also have an apprentice program. I usually have two or three apprentices every year. Um, that you know basically help me do all my bee work and, and I teach them beekeeping. So if you know anybody who doesn't have a mortgage and um, to pay and, and you know a young person who wants to do something like that, you might let them know about it. Um, so let's talk a little about overwintering. I, this is the first time I've done a presentation on overwintering, and part of my hesitation is that all beekeeping is local, but overwintering is more local than most things. Um, Obviously, Nebraska is totally different from uh, South Carolina and totally different from uh, Los Angeles and totally different from Australia. I was, I was in Australia giving, this, giving one of my presentations and I started talking about winter and they all look at me really funny. They, they get a crop in the winter, you know. They harvest honey in the winter. I don't mean the opposite season, you know, from us, kind of, you know, our winter and their summer. No, their winter. They, they harvest honey all year round. <coughs> there's, a, there's always a flow. There's never not a flow there. First of all, they have all these eucalyptus trees, and they all there's a thousand varieties, and they all bloom at different times, so there's always something to bloom. Well, talking about winter in Australia is kind of a waste of my time because there's no such thing. And even LA is really not a winter. I mean, it's kind of silly to talk about winter in LA. Here, well, at least you get some winter. I mean, you actually get cold and freezing and things aren't blooming and the bees have to get through the winter. So that's what we're going to talk about is getting them through the winter. But I point out that it's a local issue because I think you need to talk to local people and gather as much wisdom as you can from them because they're the ones who know more how much honey it's going to take to get a strong colony through the winter. Um, the, the main points are I'll list them here and I'll list them again at the end, but you want to you always keep in mind that it's regional and whatever somebody says about winter in one place isn't necessarily going to apply directly to another place. Um, but generally, you don't want them to starve, and bees often starve in the spring because they burn up so much more in the spring. We'll get back to all this. Um, you want to keep them dry because bees produce a lot of moisture in the winter. Every time they burn a molecule of honey, they produce two molecules of water and two molecules of CO2, and that 
has to go someplace. So they're burning honey and generating moisture, and that moisture has to go someplace. Uh, we'll keep them warm. That's probably not so big a deal here as it is in Nebraska, especially western Nebraska. I, when I was in western Nebraska, sometimes it was 40 below. And one year, 1984, it was 40 below every night for a month and a half. So keeping them warm is a big issue when it's 40 below for every night for a month and a half. It's not so big a deal here probably because what, what you call winter, we probably call spring. And we might call it fall, but we probably wouldn't call it winter. Um, because in, I mean, in the spring we could get zero. We could certainly get, you know, I, I've seen a freeze in the middle of May before. Not very often, but I've seen it happen. Uh, I've seen a hard frost in the middle of May. So uh, there's the issue of keeping them warm. Let us keep the mice out. The mice are just really destructive. You want to make sure that happens. But one of the big things is you want to go into the fall with a young batch of young bees. You need these new bees and they need to be fat bees so that they can live all the way through the spring. So we'll talk about each of these things. So let's start by talking about climate. Um, the typical things that people talk about here are how many boxes and how much they should weigh. And I want you to understand that uh, those are generalizations and you have to you have to apply them in a reasonable way to every colony. So for instance, if it was a late swarm and it hasn't really built up and it's only a cluster about like this, it might make it through the winter fine, but it doesn't need anywhere near as much stores as a cluster like this is going to need. So you need to adjust your thinking to the size of the cluster and also to the race of the bees. The Russians are a lot more frugal. The Carniolans are a lot more frugal. The Italians are brewery fools who will burn up all of their stores rear and brew when they really should be. <coughs> so you need to make sure the Russians have a lot more stores than a Carniolan hive would need for the same size cluster. So you need to take into account the race of the bee and whether they're frugal or not and also take into account how big the cluster is. You know, a lot of times they, people just talk in terms of boxes. Where I am, they, they'd say you need two deep boxes and it needs to weigh about 120 pounds. Um, I run eight frame mediums, so that's four eight frame mediums is the same amount of volume as two 10 frame deeps. So I kind of need four eight frame mediums that's pretty much full of bees. The bees are clustered somewhere. There's probably, it's not full of honey where they're clustered, but the rest of it should be fairly reasonably full of honey and about that size for a Italian cluster like this going into winter with Italian bees. But I'd make adjustments on that. If they were carving whole ones, they'll probably go into winter about this cluster and they probably don't need but three boxes. Uh, but they probably don't need to weigh more than 100 pounds instead of 120. But I guess what I'm saying is you, you need to not only adjust it for your climate, but adjust it for the race of bees and adjust it for the size of the cluster. Um, if you're going to experiment with wintering, uh, and especially if it's going to require special equipment like making candy boards or something like that, I suggest you do any kind of experiments in bees on a small scale, see how it works before you scale it up. Um, I've often made the mistake, and I've read where C.C. Miller says the same thing, and Jay Smith says the same thing. Of, I thought this was a brilliant idea, so they built a hundred of these things and then they ended up burning them in the wood soap because it just didn't work out. Um, you really want to do, do your experiments on a small scale, make sure they work, tweak them a little bit, and when you get them where they're really working well, then scale them up. I'd suggest you do that on anything you're doing on bees. Also, even if you're just changing your, your uh, management, not just necessarily building equipment, especially if you're building equipment, but even management, I'm not going to. If I'm going to try something new, I might just try it on four or five hives and not on every hive until I see how it's going to work out. Because you could be wrong. You often are. The bees, the bees often have totally different ideas than you do, and it doesn't turn out the way you pictured it in your head. So you think it's going to work out this way, it doesn't work out that way at all, and then now all your bees are dead and you got a bunch of equipment you don't want. So I try everything on a small scale and then scale it up if you're going to make adjustments. Um, well, the first issue we talked about 
on my list there after it being regional was pretty much you don't want them to start. So um, I'm not, I don't necessarily feed my bees, um, but I do feed them if, I, if they need to be fed. So my plan is to manage my bees so I don't need to feed them. So I try to leave them enough honey to get through the winter, but uh, the fall flow is unpredictable, and so sometimes they end up short because the fall flow fails, and then I have to feed them. I'm not afraid to feed them if they need to be fed, but I don't want to feed them if they don't need to be fed. One of the mistakes I think I see all the time is that people say it never hurts to feed them, and that's not true. Um, it can hurt a lot to feed them. It can set up robbing and get them robbed out. It can fill up all this available space, and they swarm in September, and now I've got half as many bees going into winter. Um, it can fill up every single cell, so there's nowhere for the bees to cluster. And then they all die because they can't really stay warm because they can't cluster because I filled all the space with honey. Um, feeding can hurt a lot. Feeding can also help a lot because it can keep them from starving. If they're not going to have enough food to make it through to spring, then I'm going to need to feed them. So uh, the better way to look at feeding isn't that you just feed and feed and feed and feed for no reason. Um, you need to have a target. Uh, so. And then you need to adjust that target, as we said before, for the size of the cluster and the race of the bee. But let's let's pick a, uh, an Italian-sized cluster in a, in a going into winter in a typical colony in Nebraska. I would need about 100. I need a whole hive to weigh about 120 pounds. I don't usually think in terms of how much the honey weighs, because I'm hefting the whole hive to decide what it weighs to decide what I need to feed them. So I need it to weigh about 120 pounds, so it doesn't weigh 100. If you lift a hive, and you're lifting the front, and the back is resting on the ground, then basically it should feel like it weighs about 60 pounds to weigh 120 pounds. Because you're picking up half of it, and the other half's resting on the stand, that should feel like 60 pounds. If it doesn't feel like 60 pounds, then I need to feed them more. Now, if you're not good at judging weight, uh, I think I'm pretty good at judging weight, both because I've been doing it with beekeeping all my life, and I pick up lots of 50-pound boxes of nails, and lots of 50 pound bags of feeds, so I pretty much know what 50 pounds feels like. And so uh, I, I think I'm pretty good at judging that. But you can get a scale, you can get a, a fishing scale that's actually a spring scale, and you can like hook it onto the front. If you, if you don't have a, you know, a rim, you can get under to lift it, and you can actually put a screw eye in the front of it and pick it up with that. But if you lift half the hive, it should weigh about 60 pounds in, in order to weigh 120. Now that's probably not the right number for here. It's probably more like, I don't know, maybe it needs to weigh 100 pounds here. I don't know what it needs to weigh. You need to ask around probably, find out what people tell you here. <clears throat> but my point is you need to have a target. And you shoot for that target, and when you get to that target, you stop. Because if you go over that target, then they've got nowhere to cluster. And if you go over that target, they're liable to swarm on you in September because they don't have any... As soon as the queen has nowhere to lay, you set off a sequence of events that sets off robbing. Because the sequence of events for, for are, are swarming. Because I mean. the sequence of events for swarming is uh, you've got a bunch of bees emerging and there's no and they have no job because there's no young brood to take care of. So the bees are emerging, there's no young brood to take care of, and the queen hasn't been laying, so she's been losing weight. And that's that's the scenario that they need in order to swarm. And you create that scenario anytime you feed them to the point where there's nowhere for the queen to lay. So you don't want to do that. You want to, if you do feed them, feed them and let them run out, and then they'll get things rearranged a bit, and then decide if you need to feed them some more, and then feed them a little more, and then let them use it all up and get it rearranged and see if they weigh enough. And, well, yes. When you're when you're feeding, are you feeding individual hives, or are you using a gang feeder? I always feed individual hives. Okay. Um, I try to feed them in the open. It's, it's problematic on a whole bunch of fronts. So first of all, you end up feeding every bee within a two-mile radius, and I'm not sure I want to feed all the other bees within a two-mile radius of where I am. Uh, second of all, I end up feeding the yellow jackets and the wasps, and the, uh, I'm not sure I want to feed the yellow jackets because then they go after my bees. So, uh, and then sometimes feeding in the open, especially if there's a dearth, sets off this this feeding frenzy, which sometimes spills over into a robbing frenzy. But even if it's just a feeding frenzy, I end up with a lot of dead bees because the 
police start fighting over the food. I don't know why. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do. I don't think it's, I just don't think it pays off. If I feed them in the hive, of course, another rule I've got is if I feed anybody, I feed everybody. <clears throat> uh, that's kind of contrary to what I told you about having a target, but, but the fact is if I don't feed everybody, then somebody gets robbed. So if I'm going to feed anybody, I feed everybody, and then I feed it. If somebody's underweight, I'll steal it from somebody who's overweight and give it to the one that's underweight. Um, because if I don't feed everybody, then it's like I'll set off robbing. But if I feed everybody, and the strong hive puts a little more of it away, I can steal some of that and give it to the weaker hive later on. But meanwhile, feeding everybody also stimulates everybody to raise another batch of brood in the fall, which I'm hoping to get. Uh, so, again, if there's not a failed fall flow, maybe I don't need to feed them. Maybe they've got plenty of hand to raise the brood because there's a fall flow going on. But if there's no fall flow going on, I'm probably going to have to feed them. And if there was a so-so fall flow in their life, I'm going to have to feed them. I don't, I don't want them going into winter with not enough to make it. Now, one of the things that will deceive you, especially for a new beekeeper, but anybody, is that what they burn through from uh, whenever winter sets in, let's say October, until uh, the end of December is almost nothing. They, they, they eat so little that you think they're not even, I don't mean, they don't seem to eat anything. And then after the winter solstice, they start raising brood. And then they start going through food like crazy as soon as they start raising brood because it takes a frame of honey and a frame of pollen to raise a frame of brood. And so all of a sudden, if they raise 10 frames of brood between January and April, they just burned up everything they had behind because that's pretty much all you're going to have going into winter probably is about 10 frames of honey and pollen because they're clustered in one box and the other box is full of food probably if you got two deeps and if you got a deep and a shallow or a deep and a medium i don't know what you'll have but uh, but where i am usually it's two deeps and usually the bottom deeps may be a third of the way full of honey and the top box is full of honey and that's still, they're going to burn through that entire top box by the time they raise 10 frames of brood. And they'll raise 10 frames of brood before anything blooms. So they really start burning through it in the spring. That's really when you got to watch for them to start. They almost never start in December. They start in April. They might start in March, but they're not going to start in December because they're not burning through that much stores in December. They just really start going through them in March and April when they really get serious about raising brood. About January they'll raise a little patch of brood usually and take a break. Then they'll raise another little, little bit bigger patch of brood and then take a break. And then they'll go into full brood rearing mode and just start bringing, raising brood like crazy trying to build up for the spring flow. So uh, you can't really feed syrup when the temperature is below 50 so even in the middle of winter if they're starving you really can't feed them syrup and get them back on their feet. You, you, well, maybe you can here. I don't know. If you have some 50 degree days that last for a few days, you might get it up to 50. But um, usually, if winter's already set in, then I start feeding them dry sugar because they'll, they'll eat the sugar even when it's cold. They won't eat the, they won't eat the syrup when it's cold. <clears throat> so I try to keep them, uh, I try to get them up to weight with the syrup because it stimulates them to rear brood. And I want that last hatching on the brood. And if that doesn't get them up to weight, then I give them some dry sugar to make up the difference in the weight. Or, or I steal it from a strong eye. Uh, so the other thing to keep in mind is, is, the, is the bees need somewhere to cluster. So when, when bees are clustered, you know, there's this myth that if the bees die head first in the cells in the winter, that they starve to death. Well, bees are always head first in the cells all winter. That's how they spend their winter. They die head first in the cells, it means they die. It doesn't mean they starve to death. Uh, if they die in the winter, they die head first in the cells. That's how they die. They could die of varroa mites and not starve to death, and still they'll die head first in the cells. So the fact that they're head first in the cells doesn't mean they starve, it just means that's how they cluster. So the, the density of the bees in the cluster is, is the, the cells are all full of bees that have their heads in the cells, and then in between the frames are all full of bees that have their heads out of the cells. And they keep trading places because they have to all share food, and the, 
the edges of the cluster are picking up food from the stores, sharing it with all the bees further in, and then some of the bees that were in, in the cells come out, other bees go in the cells, and they're all exchanging food and exchanging places constantly all winter. So they have to have a place to cluster. If this is all solid capped honey, then, then I've only got bees in between the frames, and they can't really keep themselves warm when they're just in between the frames. They need to be able to put their heads in the cells so they can have a solid mass of bees in the cluster. So you don't want to feed them so much that they don't have a place to cluster. That's part of the reason for your target weight, too, and, and the idea of how many boxes they're going to be in. So if you're going to say, I'm going to do them in two 10-frame deeps, and I want it to weigh 120 pounds, pretty much that means the top box is going to be full, that's about 90 pounds, and the bottom box is going to be about another 30 pounds. And so between the two of those, that's about 120 pounds. If I go over the 120 pounds, I'm starting to fill in too much of the space and these don't have a place to cluster anymore. So if I'm at 140 pounds, I might need to add a box just so the bees have some place to cluster, or I need to steal some honey so they have some place to cluster. I need them to have some place where they can cluster. Um, so, if I missed that window of getting them up to wait before it got cold, then I need to give them something so they don't starve. And that's when I do dry sugar or fondant or candy boards or one of those. I do dry sugar because it's the least amount of work and I'm lazy. Um, candy boards are real popular where I am. They, they make a box that's like out of a one by three, which is like two and a half inches. And they'll fill that full of candy and then they'll put the cover over that. And they'll put that on top of the hive and then when the bees get to the top, they get the candy and they can, they've got candy they can eat. <clears throat> now my problem with that is A, it takes special equipment because i got to make all these boxes that I put the candy in. And B, I have to make the candy. So I just feed dry sugar. I put newspaper on top and put the put a box on top of that put the sugar on the newspaper. And, uh, and spray it a little water to plump it up so it won't haul it out for trash. Because the first time I tried this, somebody told me you could do this, and so I just dumped all the sugar on there, and, bee, and I came back the next day, and the bees hauled it all out, and dumped it in front of the hive on the ground. So after that, I'd spray it and get it to clump up so they couldn't carry it out so easily. Uh, and also, it keeps it from, if they chew through the newspaper, it won't just all run down like sand through an hourglass because it's all clumped up. So I just put a layer of sugar on, spray it with a little water to get it kind of clumped, and pour, pour some more sugar on, spray it with a little water, and it looks something like that when we're done. You can also put it in a, in a frame feeder. Uh, if you do that, you want that frame feeder right up against the cluster, so, so you might even have to move it during the winter, because if it's not right up against the cluster, they'll just ignore it. Uh, this is next, this is I ran out of frame feeders, so I just dumped it on the side. But that's a solid bottom board. Uh, <coughs> so that was feeding. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is keeping them dry. Somebody once said that cold doesn't kill bees, wet does. And there's some truth to that. I think cold can kill them, but I think wet's the bigger problem. Usually wet is the reason they can't stay warm. So as they're burning honey, as I said before, if every molecule of honey that they break down, or every molecule of sugar, which is in the honey, it breaks down into two CO2s and two waters. So you got CO2 and water, and the, and the water vapor is accumulating because they're burning honey and making it. So it's not, it, it's not, it's a metabolic byproduct. They, as they burn honey, they create water, literally, and that has to go someplace. Now the problem with, uh, if you have a cold, a lid that's colder than the warm air inside and you have moist air hitting that cold top and it often drips on the bees. Um, so that's one of the reasons some people put insulation on the top is it helps eliminate some of that. It's one of the reasons the inner cover was invented was to create an air space between the top and the, and the colony down below so that it wouldn't get so much condensation. And if there was condensation, hopefully it happened on the top cover and drip on the inner cover instead of dripping on the bees. That was that was the plan. So you're trying to eliminate condensation. Uh, 
the, the simplest way, I think, is to let that moisture out. Moist air rises, and if you have some kind of top entrance, it will go out the top. Um, and you don't want too big a top entrance. You, you kind of want to let it gradually come out the top, but you don't want all the warm air leaking out the top. So well, I have a top entrance all the time, and it's about two and a half inches by three eighths of an inch, and that's my entrance all year round. And that's my entrance in the winter, that's my entrance in the summer. Um, that seems to work out pretty well, but the moisture can get out, the bees have enough room, they don't have a traffic jam, and, um, and they don't hardly ever get robbed. Uh, so your bottom is closed off? Yeah, all my bottom entrances are closed. There's no bottom entrance. All year? <clears throat> all year round, yeah. I only have a top entrance. And I used to I used to make that adjustable and I had an entrance reducer I'm on a pivot. I put one nail in the middle and I turn it and open it in the summer and close it in the winter. But the more I looked at it, the ones I forgot to open seemed to do better than the ones I opened. So I started just leaving them closed all the time. So then I finally just started gluing the entrance reducer in there and I don't even I don't pivot it at all anymore. I just nail it in and leave it. Um, the bees have to control the environment, and in order to control the environment, they need they need minimal ventilation that they control, as opposed to the maximum ventilation they can't control. So, for instance, a wide open entrance and a wide open screen bottom board, they have no control over the ventilation. There's just so much air moving through there. They just they're just living with what whatever they have to live with, and they don't have any choice. Um, I think they need control. Huber did a bunch of research on ventilation, and he concluded that the bees could actually ventilate a hive better with one entrance than they could with two entrances, because they know how to do that. They, 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 they set up all the bees and circulate the air, and with one entrance, that it, it kind of fits their model of how they do that. With two entrances, they'll make do, but they have to work harder at it. If you make even more than that, then you make it even harder for them. I, I've never... I'd like, like to know the answer to this, but you know, you've got bees bearding. Sometimes if you open up a screen bottom board and open the entrance wide open, you get them all to move back inside, and you think you've done them a favor. But I'm not so sure. They were all hanging out and relaxing on the outside of the hive, and now I mean they have to go back in and work at keeping the hive the temperature they need. Uh, maybe I actually created a bunch of work, and they have to go in and do this work now. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'd be curious to know whether I made it easier or harder for them, but I suspect I made it harder for them is what I suspect. But when I opened it all wide open, now you know they're air conditioning this, this colony. They're evaporating water to keep it cool, so they're hauling water and evaporating the water. And now you opened everything wide open. If you were air conditioning your house, is that how you would air condition it? You open the doors wide open? I, I don't think so. Um, I think you want to you want to control the ventilation, not, not have it wide open. Now the bees do need ventilation because they have to get rid of the moisture they evaporated to cool it off. So they're evaporating water to cool it off. Now they need to get rid of that moisture so they can evaporate more water to keep it cool. So they need that moisture to go out of the hive without without it without losing control of the ventilation of the hive. So I think the top entrance works well for that even in the summer because. Um, it's letting the moisture out, they're evaporating water, and it lets that moisture out, and they can keep evaporating more water and let the moisture out without a wide open, you know, all this air is going through the hive and they can't control it. Does that make sense? Yes. So we're trained that you need to have a entrance, you need to have a, a landing board at your entrance. I don't um, have any landing boards. So if you have the top... Show me a tree with a landing board, I want to see one. Well, I've never seen one. <laughs> you know, just just uh, some place for them to land before they. But they but they don't need a place to land. They don't. Yeah. No, mine fly right. That's in the what door. I'm saying. It's, it's mine fly right in the door. They don't land. They fly right right, right in the door and land somewhere inside the hive. I don't know. They don't land on the. A few of them land on the outside and then crawl in, but most of them fly straight in the door. Uh, and so you just have a flat bottom. Not only do people have a landing board, they have a mouse ramp. You know, the mouse ramp that helps the mice get up to get into the hive there. <laughs> slow thing. I don't understand the mouse ramp thing. It makes no sense to me. I've never seen a bee use it, but the, I've seen mice use it. Um, now, nah, bees don't need a landing board. In fact, I cut all the landing boards off all my bottom boards 
as a, as a matter of actually usually I cut it off and then I use the piece I cut off to block the entrance to block the bottom entrance so um, yeah they don't need that anymore is it good it's, well, it's just a myth you know for some reason everybody wants to make it a high complicated, I've never quite understood the appeal of it, but even Langstroth made that mistake. If you look at Langstroth's patent, he patented a whole bunch of fancy doodads that nobody does. And the reason his hive caught on really was because it wasn't the fancy one that he designed, it's the, it's the simplified version of it. The Langstroth hive caught on because it's simple, it's not complicated, and that makes it inexpensive and it makes it practical because it's simple. It's nothing but a box with some frames hanging in it. And that's why it's reasonable and it works. I've got two Slovenian hives at home, and I think they must have sat around at night trying to figure out how to make it more complicated. Because it is the most complicated hive I've ever, I've ever seen. It's got like the entrance reducer is on a hinge, and, and so, so you could you flip flop the hinge open and have a wide open entrance. You could close it this way and open another little door over here. And then you can put this other little doodad in there to reduce it even more. And then you can, it's, just, it's got more doodads and whatnots than anything I've ever seen. And then that's just the front of the hive. The back of the hive has even more doodads and whatnots on it. <clears throat> I don't know how they managed to make it so complicated. But I think that's part of the landing board thing. It's like, oh, we got, we got to try and make it easier for the bees. This is going to help the bees. Yeah, I don't think so. If it was that great, then they'd probably get some problems and build themselves a little landing board, but they don't, so.